Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest installment of Power Huddle, Inside the Mind of ESG Gurus. I'm Heidi Friedman, a partner and co-chair of Thompson Hines ESG Collaborative. During this monthly series, I chat one-on-one -on -one with innovative ESG execs, and we have a wonderful exec today. These unscripted discussions examine how company execs from various in industries are paving the way as ESG trendsetters in championing pragmatic ESG strategies to align with their business values while building a sustainability framework and advancing their company's ESG goals. Joining me today is Jen Huffstetler, and she has a long title, so hold on, Chief Product Sustainability Officer and Vice President General Manager of Intel Future Platform Strategy and Sustainability. That sounds um, so fun, but so big, and I can't wait to talk about it. So Jen is responsible for driving the integration and execution of the corporate level product strategy to drive future growth across clients, cloud, network, and edge to deliver sustainable computing for a sustainable future. And this is really exciting because, Jen, you're our first techie um, ESG person, so I think that'll be a really interesting discussion. So welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Heidi. I'm grateful to be here. So before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Today's program is being recorded. It will be available at the Thompson High YouTube library, along with the prior recordings. This presentation is intended for general, in, general information of individuals and organizations on matters of current interest. The thoughts and opinions being expressed today are those of individuals and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of our clients, employers, affiliates, or Thompson Hine. The content should not be taken as advice as the views expressed are for informational purposes only. So if you have questions during our 30 minutes together, please put the chat to Heidi Friedman. Feel free to send your questions and we'll try to get to them through my discussion with Jen today. So we do invite you to participate. So Jen, you have a really interesting ESG journey. Will you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, it, it all began back in middle school, actually. <laughs> um, I was entering eighth grade and had a really innovative teacher who opened my mind to something uh, that was called the National Energy Education Day Project. I know Heidi is in Cleveland. I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. And, you know, part of what we were able to do back then was go around to other schools, elementary schools, middle schools, and help to educate them on renewable energy, the choices that they're making around, you know, waste and water, just being more conservationist in their approaches. Um, so that was the beginning of the journey. And, you know, that my career took me mostly just through product management, but where it ended up in about 2020 was looking out for the future of our data center business. Mm. Um, what were the key trends that are happening that are gonna affect our, our overall business? And sustainability had been, you know, certainly on, on the mark for a decade. And we participated in standing up things like the green grid back in the aughts and, you know, through innovations, saving energy around the world. Do you think about just the innovation in the last decade alone, we estimate we've saved like a thousand terawatt hours just in the data center by having, you know, product innovations. So we were, you know, a couple of years ago, we put forth our Intel rise strategy. So being responsible, inclusive, sustainable, and enabling, uh, and our customers were setting their own bold goals and they started asking us hey, where's your net zero roadmap? You know, what's the product roadmap that, that gets there and how can we partner together to shape the industry? That really led me to lead a corporate discussion uh, around setting a bold goal around net zero and uh, activating a strategy across the company. And that led me to the role that I'm in today um, for the last two years, looking after the product side of the company and helping our customers to lower their footprint, ensuring our products are designed to be the most energy efficient, um, lowering carbon gen over gen, um, building solutions. The software can um, you know, represent 30% waste 
Um, so build and working with ecosystem partners to build solutions that customers can deploy. Um, but this builds upon this incredible 30 year foundation in our own environmental health and safety group, where I have a partner, um, Todd Brady, who for those decades had been setting goals and driving down our environmental footprint in every community within which we operate. And so, you know, we're proud to say, you know, we, we had our first CDP reporting in 1994. Four, right? Wow. Like we've been at this a, a very long time. Yes. <laughs> One of the first, right? We were some of the first pioneers in what's called a, you know, virtual power procurement agreement for sure. renewable electricity. Um, and so that really spawned a lot of others in the corporate space. Um, today we operate our global factory network because we're both a manufacturing company mm -hmm. and a product company. So you really kind of have to think of us in these two lenses. And Todd and I looking after those respective parts of the organization. Um, and when we're at, you know, 93% renewable electricity globally, that means that the products that we build in those factories, like our data center processors, they have a lower embodied carbon footprint. Um, so that, that brings me to today, you know, as I mentioned, where I'm driving strategy uh, across our product teams, across the company from, you know, our labs pathfinding all the way to solutions, go to market and helping our customers, um, some of whom are which really are really forward looking, um, mm -hmm. like a big pharma in Europe. And they're not looking at an ROI, they're looking for a carbon ROI. Mm. And so helping them on that journey. Yeah. Wow. And first of all, I love that it started in middle school. So whoever thinks that it doesn't matter what we're talking to our kids about, you know, when they're in sixth and seventh grade, apparently it does. Look at look at you. Um, and I think you raised such an important point, John, which is, you know, sustain, I, I've been doing environmental law for 30 years and sustainability. So ESG is just different versions of that and pulling it all the pieces, parts under the same umbrella, um, which allows us to sort of do good by doing well or whatever that saying is. So I, lo I love that you guys have been invested for so long, but yet you're still trying to, you know, drive and help others. What, in that process, what do you think your biggest challenge in the ESG realm is right now? Um, well, one of the biggest challenges that I think about is, you know, what's going to level the playing field for the whole industry around carbon? And it's how do you, you know, bring renewable electricity everywhere? So that's actually one of the strategies that we're working on is how do you, because once you do that, you're not only, you know, we've obviously, um, you know, set our net zero goal with that renewable electricity around our scope one and two operations. Mm -hmm. um, but now how do you accelerate it for the supply chain, right? And scope three, the upstream, how do you achieve it for the downstream uh, scope three, which is product in use and you can envision for us computers everywhere <laughs> are right. on and, um, you know, burning energy. And so, you know, we, we see that as a really big challenge, but also an opportunity uh, to help partner across the ecosystem. So one of the things that we've, you know, that we're very proud of that we've done is put together a program uh, with Schneider Electric to help that supply chain come together as smaller players to gain access to some of those benefits, like a virtual power purchase agreement by aggregating their demand. Um, so that program is called Catalyze. Really proud of that. Another one is um, in grid modernization. So you start to think about, and I live in Oregon, so we've got lots of renewable electricity, um, whether it's the wind, the solar, or hydro. Mm. And our grids were built 100 years ago. Yeah. So how do you modernize the grid so that it's able to accept the two-way um, you know, load, whereas traditionally it was just a one-way load. And so we partner um, and, and built uh, an alliance so that, you know, together, this is that solution space, like nobody can do this alone. It's going to take all of us, um, you know, this edge for smart secondary substations, it's E4S, you know, you've got um, partners like an Iberdrola, uh, Dell, a VMware, bringing together and putting solutions together so that you can now modernize that grid and handle that dynamic load. Um, so 
you know, when I think about the biggest challenge, it's how do we accelerate that access to renewable electricity, but it also becomes some of the biggest opportunities uh, that we have to partner as an industry. Absolutely. I, I love the name of your program. One of my favorite quotes ever is we rise by lifting others. So the fact that you have a program called Rise and you're doing these things to, you know, help people on both ends of the value chain is really kind of lifting the whole process. And, um, you know, VPPs VPs are definitely very popular, but I also see sort of a reluctance on the offset market, um, on the carbon offset mar market versus just actual, you know, reductions, which you've talked a lot about. Do you have a view on that, like in, in using the offset market versus trying to manage and take out actual reductions? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, our decades of investment in this area, right? The actions and investments we've made in abatement, you know, materials and recycling, uh, the chemicals within our factory reductions, um, that remains our primary focus because we really, you know, pride ourselves on uh, the transparency, the comprehensiveness, the governance that we have and the importance of actual reductions um, as our first and number one priority. Mm -hmm. When we set our, um, our ambitious uh, 2040 net zero for our operations goal, what you might not understand, right, depending on what background you're coming from, is this is a, a, over a 50 year industry and it's going to require green chemistry innovations mm -hmm. to achieve that 2040 goal. And so rather than trying to offset, you know, we would like that to be a last resort so that we're working and exhausting the entire ecosystem. We've got work streams set up um, through there's government funding, the ML Commons is, is one of them, uh, and partnerships with academia to really get at the front edge of what we need to decarbonize our industry, which is some of those new innovations. Um, and then, you know, I think what you're seeing um, in the global market today as well is, you know, there's a shifting landscape around those offsets and what is going to be acceptable in terms of talk, speaking about your products, about the carbon and really having a clear traceability to your own value chain that was decarbonized versus, you know, maybe an offset in one part of the country that had nothing to do uh, with your actual supply chain. So I think we're going to see more regulations in that space as well. Yeah, I love that you're focusing on both reductions and reliability. I think Sometimes people, companies get way too theoretical and re don't realize that, you know, this actually has to work and to make sure that, um, you know, we have a stable grid. So I, I love all that you're doing in that space. And I was going to ask you what you felt was your greatest ESG success, but you just named three or four things that I think are incredible successes. I don't know if you have a favorite one out of what you've been able to accomplish so far. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I won't repeat the, the two that we're working on for the renewable electricity, but I would say I, I feel like we've had a great success in these last two years in opening the, C, the chief sustainability officer's minds to the need um, to understand how technology is going to help them meet their goals. Mm -hmm. um, so we've done some research uh, and, you know, most IT decision makers, CIOs, they're not talking to a chief sustainability officer. Uh, that relationship might be through a program management on overall energy reduction goals that they have, um, but there's not a partnership there. And I'm seeing more and more of, you know, my peers in the industry start to talk about that language. We've called it the sustainable CTO, but it's mm. also the tech enabled CSO. Yes. And so, you know, I feel like, I feel like that's becoming pervasive and I'm pretty proud of that because we do believe while technology, uh, you know, obviously there's, there's all the carbon required to make the products and what they use. Um, they really are helping to lower the footprint of the planet. And I believe that, you know, by deploying technology to manage energy in your buildings, in your cities, right? You can be managing um, the traffic flow. That's through technology and through predicting uh, the traffic flows using AI. And um, that's going to help to decarbonize every industry on the planet by applying technology. 
Um, so I really feel like we've made a lot of great progress there. And, you know, you're going to see more and more discussions about technology solutions to help lower the footprint. Yeah. And, and you mentioned AI, right? So we, we can't talk about ESG in the tech industry without talking about AI. I know you guys have a new business. Um, I think it's called Articulate A. Is that correct? Yes, so, Articulate so, AI. Yeah. AI. So, and, um, and I'm super excited about it. It's fun to read about it. And just, you know, I'm not sure people naturally think of AI's place within ESG. And I really think you have to, first of all. Um, but I think you're the probably the best person I've met to tell us how those two get integrated. So uh, what are your thoughts of where AI fits into ESG? Yeah, well, you know, we can start at the big level and then I can give a couple of real examples to, to hit it home. So at the, the highest level, we see the intersectionality of, of AI and sustainability in two ways. One is around how do we make AI more sustainable? And the second one is how do you deploy AI to improve sustainability? So starting first on how do you make it more sustainable? Um, we know as AI has become common language now, uh, yes. thanks to chat GPT and open AI unleashing that for the world. Um, what we know is that it can be really energy intensive mm -hmm. to exactly. train those extraordinarily large models that are, you know, stressing like 100, 200 billion parameters is how they talk about it. Um, and that strains the energy resources that we have, whether you're in a, um, in Europe where energy prices have skyrocketed due to the war on Ukraine and the restrict, you know, the different uh, geopolitical things that are happening on their energy system or just in our local um, areas. You know, and when I talk with data center operators, uh, energy commissions um, and local cities and governments, they're feeling that strain. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, you look at an example like GPT-3, which maybe many of us, you know, have experimented with um, as that background model in chat GPT to train that model it was estimated that it used 1.28 gigawatt hours of electricity. Wow. That's the same as, you know, powering 120 homes for a year, or I, I, I travel for work, which is always, you know, a challenge with the car, right. um, but right. that, it would be 550 round trips between wow. New York city and San Francisco, just to put that in context. Now, training these models so that they're able to ingest all that data, that's just one, of the use cases, the other use cases, you know, checking that the model is accurate and how it's being used. You think about a weather model, you know, they're training it once, but we're all utilizing it and we're mm -hmm. checking the weather. What is it? <laughs> what is it telling us? Um, the inference uh, of these models ex is expected to be two to three times the amount of power that was needed to train the model. And so when we think about how do you make AI more sustainable? We think about it in three regards. Uh, the first is the model itself. Um, when you are looking at, you know, a specific company's needs, like maybe it's your, your legal practice, mm -hmm. you're not going to need the world's information, although it's got, um, you know, the understanding and the, the language semantics um, to serve up, you know, case, case documents or things sure. that are relevant for your team to improve their efficiency there's an opportunity to optimize the models. And that's actually what Articulate AI does, is it um, it then takes a model that's been trained to understand the language, but then it only, it will train again on your data. The example that, that we used when we launched was um, with BCG, uh, the yeah. consulting firm, it helped them with all their consultants to train over 50,000 documents and really enabling and scaling the ease of access to that information. Um, and that's a much smaller model, right? And it's on their own servers and it's what we call an enterprise AI or a private mm -hmm. model. That's okay. going to take far less energy than these giant models that you know people might be using for everything. So I think when we start to see it come into practice, there's lots of fancy tools and techniques to reduce the model, but I think that's kind of the simplest example um, and those can run on, you know, 
just even a CPU, if the model's smaller, something like 7 billion parameters or 10 billion parameters. Um, so that's a, that's a really key piece. The other two areas um, to help AI be more sustainable is making sure the hardware is well utilized mm -hmm. and that the software um, is, you know, that the hardware is efficient so that it's, you know, delivering as much performance at, performance at the lowest uh, energy consumption, but then that the software is tightly integrated to it. And it's something I like to say, basically the semiconductor industry is in the business of, you know, delivering transistors. And how do you ensure that no transistors left behind? A lot of energy and, you know, carbon went into making that transistor. And so when you're able to more tightly couple a workload to the hardware, you're gonna get a more efficient outcome. And you can see savings of 30% of the energy wow. uh, if you're, you know, able to deploy it in a more tightly coupled fashion. There's even newer technologies because we look, you know, in my product role, we're looking not only from the silicon uh, to the PC client and, you know, the, the aluminum that goes around it, but also to the data center. And there's these newer technologies that help to eliminate water usage, which isn't always talked about in the environmental space, but, you know, the water consumption and water sure. is a very scarce resource. So how are we looking uh, to eliminate, you know, water usage in these data centers as well? Yeah, I mean, but, any manufacturing process that uses water, that's definitely something that I, we have a lot of clients looking at how to do that more effectively and efficiently. And I, I love your examples on, those are fantastic, I might have to seal them, um, on sort of the amount of energy an AI, you know, sort of large system can take to um, fulfill any kind of requirements because, you know, at the firm, we did our first DSG report last year. We did a materiality assessment, all those kind of great things. And we didn't really focus on the, the, um, AI piece of that, which is sort of generated since we finished that a lot more, um, in our space. And now you have to consider like, what energy are you using towards that and how that impacts your goals and numbers. And, and people are surprised when I say that and ask that question, but, um, clearly, you guys are in front of that, and you're actually using it for the positive. Uh, and and w w is that, would you also say, you know, is that the one really unique challenge in the tech industry right now with regard to ESG, the AI piece, or is there something else that you think might, you know, be unique to your industry um, under the ESG umbrella? Um, well, so I think AI is very top of mind for every enterprise, every company, how can we become more efficient and effective and grow our business? So I think, you know, that's going to be top of mind. And then of course the concerns that come with it. Um, I think everyone's starting to do experiments though, and learn how to deploy AI to improve the sustainability. Like one mm -hmm. example is with a telecom provider where they're monitoring the network traffic for high and low demand. And they're able through that prediction, to lower the consumption of the server and lower their energy mm. consumption for a 5G network, which we all have cell phones <laughs> all around the world. And, right. You know, we're all users of that. So it's nice to know that, um, you know, large companies are, are deploying AI to improve sustainability. Um, but in terms of a unique challenge in this space, it, I think it's really around standards, right? Um, we have not, there aren't yet standards around yeah the measurement, um, you know, of carbon, either in the silicon process, uh, at the motherboard, it's, you know, in, in the data center, if you're using a cloud service, what it, what is the, is, you know, if, if cloud service A and B give me two different numbers, are they comparable? Not mm -hmm. really because they're apples and oranges. Um, so that's a unique space where we, um, are partnering. It's an area for the government to have a role, obviously. Okay. Um, and you're seeing some of that get started in the EU. They have something called the Energy Efficiency Directive, yeah. looking to start reporting. And then I think we can envision regulations will be coming after that. Um, and we're partnering with MIT and mm. the Semiconductor uh, Climate Consortia, which is under our industry's uh, trade association of SEMI, so that we can define methodologies that we as an industry can align to. And I think once you get to those common methodologies, then you'll be able to drive the standards and, you know, have some common comparisons in the ecosystem. Yeah. 
wow, you guys have a lot of partnerships and they are very impressive. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely leading the change on these things. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna remind everybody, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat to me um, and we'll try to address them before we end here in a few minutes. So since you are so products focused, Jen, I did wanna just get your views on the increase in greenwashing. I think I mentioned to you yesterday, I heard something called AI washing. That was a new one for me. Um, but, you know, I, I, in, in turn, there's an uptick, right? And um, oh, the courts have been actually pretty supportive of companies on some of these claims, and there's been motions to dismiss granted. But just sort of what's your view on the greenwashing world and the increase in litigation around, um, you know, allegedly greener products and sustainable products and all of that? Yeah, well, we're definitely seeing in the demographics that, you know, consumers want to buy greener products. So it becomes very important, you know, going back to that last uh, response that we have transparency mm -hmm. uh, in in the claims that are being made and that there's, you know, a real like if you're using the offsets that it's truly offset from your business mm -hmm. operations around the globe. Um, I haven't tracked it as closely in the US, but certainly um, lots of litigation starting in the EU. And I think that's part of why the directives came out in the, the last week or two uh, to really try to limit um, the extent of this so that there is more transparency for consumers, um, that they you know have that truth in and knowing that what's being said is real. Um, so I think it's just going to get more attention. The AI washing is new to me, so I was doing a little <laughs> research on that myself this morning. Um, but it's it sounds like it's very similar, right? If you're saying your product's AI enabled, what does that really mean? You know, it's it's certainly a moment when you know, as we talked about, every every enterprise on the planet is thinking about every business about how they use that to drive their growth. Yeah, and, and transparency is everything. In fact, I use the term, which I throw out to you, greener products, which I we tell our clients, don't use that. Tell them what specifically makes it better for the environment, right? So that's um, right. You know, and and it's important just to be clear, and, and it benefits everybody. It doesn't help, honestly, if you're trying to um, not be transparent. So. And you obviously mentioned sort of the regulatory framework. I know that's not necessarily your specific realm, but is there anything that Intel is doing to get ready for what we're going to see in the SEC world, the CSRD compliance, whatever's going on in California and all these other states? Obviously, we're we're moving from a voluntary framework to some kind of mandatory framework, although still very unclear. Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think every business is probably grappling with this. Um, in we didn't really talk about there's lots of ways to organize your esg work and i think ours is actually it's interesting and unique and it helps us to infuse that um, sustainability mindset across our operations our business services functions as well as the product teams um, so things that we're doing to prepare you know we're always looking ahead at the coming regulations uh, we're looking at what investments and tools and systems that we need to prepare for um, you know, what will become the future auditing of that data, um, you know, so so that's a journey that that we're always on is, you know, looking at what's coming and what do we need to be doing to invest to prepare um, for for those compliance requirements that that are likely heading this way. Yeah. And you guys have a very strong cross um, company team that works on these issues. I do think it's worth you just mentioning how you do that because it's so effective in my view. Yeah, no, I, it's um, we we have three main, I will say it offices and that rise strategy, our whole CSR report, which we're also familiar with that is hosted out of our um, chief responsibility office mm -hmm. that actually sits in our HR function. Okay, um, and so they are the ones partnering across the company right to to bring that together. Um, Todd looks after our operations and so he works across our manufacturing, our office buildings globally to set the targets and drive the progress so that we're able to achieve net zero waste and net zero water. Net positive water is actually where we're at in, in many mm. areas. And then my team uh, working across the, the many product business units, um, 
legal, of course, and finance are integrated into all of those teams. And so they're there supporting us on the journey, um, you know, from those different domains. That's yeah. Great. What a great holistic approach. So one last fun question, when you're not changing the world with all of this, what do you do for fun? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I love to play volleyball and be near on or in water. <laughs> okay. Well, good. Uh, that sounds fun. So you can play volleyball on the beach and then you'll be really happy. That's right. So that's perfect. <laughs> so that concludes today's discussion. Again, this webinar was recorded and will be available to view in our library of Thompson Hine recordings on YouTube. We encourage you to visit our page and stay up to date. We certainly want to thank you for attending today's program and a very, very special thanks to Jen. I feel like I learned so much today and what you guys are just doing really amazing things and changing this space. So um, we really appreciate it and I appreciate you and um, wish you a good rest, rest of the week. Thanks everyone for joining us. Take care. Thank you so much for having me, Heidi. Wonderful conversation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.